thank you, Teaching House. Thank you, uh, everybody, for this spectacular turnout. I can see quite a few names and faces that I recognize, which is slightly intimidating. I thought this was going to be a little groupy whoopy thing, Lizzie. And now we've got this international audience with people jetting in from uh, Ukraine, <laughs> Thailand. Isn't it time you were in bed, Matthew? Um, it's, I'm flattered and honored. And I, oh, Jennifer Jones is here um, from Canada. This is wonderful, ex students of mine. I'm overwhelmed. It does mean that most of the jokes that I was going to tell you will have already heard. Just have to bear with me and some of the texts as well. I'm a bit uh, repetitive, as you know. Um, Kevin Wong, <laughs> Kevin, hi. Wow, is that the, the Kevin Wong? Um, so let's get going. Uh, we've got just under uh, three quarters of an hour, and I do want to make this sort of an interactive, given the title. Um, Maria, hi. Um, <laughs> thank you, Matthew. Um, let's uh, let's get this show on the road. Okay, I'm going to. Uh, Okay, brilliant. Um, here's a little story. I was a teacher trainer uh, on CELTA and DELTA courses in International House Barcelona, sadly defunct. Now that's another story. Uh, one of my dearest and closest colleagues on the course was a guy called Neil Forrest, who's now retired. And uh, we worked on 16 DELTA courses together over a period of time and a number of CELTAs, et cetera. And we also taught. And that was one of the great things about International House. You weren't just a teacher trainer, you had to teach as well. And we sometimes this involved just covering other people's classes. Neil had to cover a class one day and he taught in his inimitable fashion. Um, I'll leave you to guess, but Neil was a heavy, a big influence on my thinking about teaching and pedagogy generally. Uh, and subsequently, about two weeks after this lesson that he substituted, he met one of the students, a young woman on the train back to uh, where he lived, lives in, um, and she's, and he said, oh yeah, nice to see you. And she said, yes, are you going to teach us again? And he said, no, 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 that was, that was just a substitute. Um, and uh, he said, why? She said, well, you know, she said, our teacher's very nice. Our teacher's very nice. But she never, okay, now I'm going to ask you in the chat to uh, don't click send, don't click send, just write into the chat what you think this continuation of the sentence is, do not <laughs> click send, just write it into the chat, and when I give you the signal, you click send, okay, how does this sentence continue, our teacher's very nice, said this woman, who Neil had taught, but she never Okay, you can write your guesses, but don't click send, don't click send. Okay, are we ready? And in a second, uh, I'll give you the go ahead. Okay, off you go, click send. <laughs> I've never done this before. This is an idea of Sandy Millen. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's to, preempt people second guessing or using what somebody else the waterfall exactly thank you rachel uh okay what flashed by then uh at the speed of light was a lot of responses like lets us talk um repeats calls on me corrects my pronunciation smiles chats with us chats with us, chats with us. okay fine so um very good that was interesting and that's what she said in fact she never talks to us she never talks to us. She never talks to us. And Neil, Neil, whose whole style of teaching is about talking to the learners and listening to what they've got to say, was kind of nonplussed by this because to him, this was tantamount to like your, your, I don't know, somebody saying my children are very nice, but they never talk to me. Yeah, or my, my partner is very nice, but he never talks to me. And uh, he thought this was a kind of uh, a, a sort of rather sad to, to have to say that about a teacher. That's story number one. Story number two, and again, most of you have seen this before, but this was a transcript of a piece of um, classroom 
uh, interaction that took place in a school allegedly in Mexico. I mean, I say allegedly, it was written up in the English language teaching journal. Uh, so the teacher is uh, at the beginning of the lesson, she's taking the register and she starts chatting to the students. And she says to one of them, Jorge, did you have a good weekend? And he says, Jorge says, yes, what did you do? I got married. You got married. Well, you certainly had a good weekend then. Pause, laughter and buzz of conversation. Teacher, now turn to page 56 in your books. You remember last time we were talking about biographies? The teacher checks the book and the lesson plan, the lesson plan while the other students talk to Jorge in Spanish about his wedding. So there you have it, a teacher who doesn't talk to at least one of the students in the class has probably got something to say. So here we have it, this, this tension between page 56, yeah, what could be more important than page 56? What could be more important than the lesson plan? Certainly not one of the students getting married. And arguably, and I, I'm not either, I'm not condemning or defending this teacher. You know, we don't know the context in which she was working, but this is how, uh, this is what happened. And some people would say, well, you know, she was quite right, actually, because page 56 is more important. And because what's to stop Jorge running away with the lesson, talking about his wedding? People like Paul Seedhouse, for example, who's written exhaustively on classroom interaction, says, I will argue that it is, in theory, not possible for teachers to replicate conversation in the classroom as part of a lesson. It's not possible. This is not to suggest that it is impossible for conversation to take place in the classroom, simply that it cannot occur as part of a lesson. It cannot occur as part of a lesson. And people have been saying this for a very, very long time for all sorts of different reasons. Harold Palmer, Harold Palmer, you know, the, the, the patriarch of applied linguistics in the 19, 100 years ago to this day, he says normal conversation can only be profitably employed uh, with students who are already fairly proficient in the language, who can converse without making more than an occasional mistake. You see, that's what it's all about. Don't let them have conversations because they will make mistakes. He says, if we encourage the student to use normal conversation before he has been drilled, shout out to Lizzie, into good habits, we cause him to become a fluent speaker, not of English, but of pidgin. And of course, so the methodology that, uh, that uh, Palmer espoused is very much this kind of drill and kill methodology using sentences for which it is difficult to think of a context. This is my head, that is your head. Is this my head? Is this your head? Is this my head or your head? Is this my head or my foot? And so on. I have a story to tell about that actually, which is quite funny, but you've probably all heard it before. So we'll move on. Um, and of course, what you get here, what you see here is a particular kind of question that is permitted in language classes. And in fact, it's permitted in lots of kinds of classes. And it's the difference between this kind of question, as in, is this my head or is that your head? How many fingers have I got? As opposed to this kind of question, how many brothers have you got? Which is the difference between, if you want to bang that into the, uh, yes, thank you, Rachel, display versus real, thank you. Uh, display questions where students are invited to display their knowledge. Yes, or referential questions, real questions on the right. How many brothers have you got? Which is a real question because I don't know and I'm asking you, yeah? So that's the difference. How many fingers have I got? What's the capital of Peru, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What's two and two real uh, display questions? Display knowledge, display knowledge. And we get whole sequences of them in language classrooms as well as all sorts of other classrooms. Here, for example, is a, uh, well, they also form part of a, um, uh, an exchange formula, if you like, which is the famous IRF exchange, yeah? How many fingers have I got? Students say five, and the teacher says, good, yeah? Initiate, respond, and follow up or feedback or whatever you want to call it. Very, 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 very common. We can see whole sequence of these in uh, transcripts of classroom interaction. This is a, this is a, one page of three pages. I've kind of um, broken it down. Uh, it goes on and on. There's, there's two pages before this of a teacher in Australia saying, what's these? Pants, clothes, trousers, 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 color, green, green. Okay, green trousers, sentence, 
What color? Not question, sentence. You wear where you are wearing. Joe, you are wearing the green trousers. Okay, I'm wearing, I'm wearing green trousers. I'm wearing green trousers. What's the question? What, 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 what are you wearing? What are you wearing? What are you wearing? Drill, drill, drill. What are you wearing? What are you wearing? This comes from a transcript collected by David Moonham. So we get a very typical sequence, which is um, some people would say is not very uh, lifelike. And uh, Barnes, way back, uh, said in such an exchange, the pupils can only be dependent upon the teacher's signals. Now, rational thought of their own is unlikely to be rewarded. Such sequences as these are, however, a normal part of question and answer lessons. We recognize them. They are, we've done them. We do them. I've done them. Um, but a more harsh criticism would say the language used establishes a pattern of communication which gives only the illusion that learning is actually occurring. No learning is occurring. It is an illusion. I want to just step aside here and talk about something that I read recently, this book. Uh, nothing to do with language teaching, but I read a lot of language teaching into it. The most human human. Now, this is, you may have heard of the Alan Turing Prize. The Alan Turing Prize is a prize set up, um, prompted by something that Alan Turing, the noted computer scientist said many years ago, that there will come a point where you can't tell machines from real people. Or he challenged people to work out how you would tell that you are interacting with a machine as opposed to a real person. So they have a competition every year and they have people interacting with computers. They don't know they're computers. They just interact. They, they're typing, yeah, but it could be a real person behind the screen, but they don't know. And they're also interacting with real people behind a screen who's also typing. Yeah? And then they've got to decide which is the computer and which is the real person. Now, who are these real people who do this? Well, there are people like Brian Christian, who wrote this book, and he's written a whole book because he was voted by people who have, have been on this competition as the most human human. He was the one who could really tell he was a human and not a computer. How? What was it about his responses to the questions which were human as opposed to computers? Well, you can find out by doing, there's lots of these things online, bots. Yeah, here's, this is the, try it. I think it's still there. Tutor Mike, this is for, uh, language learning purposes. So you go to this website and Mike will start asking you questions. This is an exchange I had with Mike or part of an exchange I had with Mike. Now there he is. There's the exchange. Here's the exchange. Let me ask you a question. Uh, says Mike, how's the job market in your country? So me, not good. What's wrong? 20% unemployment. Mike, can I ask you a question? What do you think is the most dangerous sport? Are you getting a sense of a little bit of incoherence here? In Ping pong, I say. This is me being clever. I think boxing is the most dangerous sport, says, says Mike. I don't agree. No problem, says Mike. You have, ever have you ever boxed, I ask? I have no idea. So you can see this is not real communication. It approximates real communication. It's a simulation of real communication, but it differs in specific points. And I've um, sort of extrapolating from this book, uh, these are some of the things that, uh, that Christian, Brian Christian, identifies as being uh, characteristic of non-human communication as opposed to human communication. Non-human communication is, per, per, is just reactive. Which is, you, the machine is reacting, picking up words and throwing them back at you in a sentence, hope, hoping for the best, yeah? Whereas human communication is two-way, it's interactive. Non-human communication tends to be unsituated, it's decontextualized, it's, it's disembodied. Yeah, was most human co communication, even online communication, is this is situated. I'm talking to you now, but it's kind of situated. I can see you. Blah, blah, blah. Um, non human communication is whatever, whereas human communication is much more creative and unpredictable, therefore. Scripted, jointly constructed, disembodied, embodied, narrowband versus broadband. Narrowband versus broadband is a distinction I use to describe narrowband syllabuses where it's a focus on just one piece of one language point. Yeah, I'm just going to ask you about clothing and nothing else kind of thing. Whereas a broadband, as in real conversation, tends to cover a greater range of topics and without any restriction on the language choices made. So what I'm going to argue, what I'm arguing, obviously, is that non-human communication is what happens in classrooms. 
even if it is real humans, it's not computers. That's what happens in that clothes classroom. And what happened in Jorge's wedding classroom was non-human communication. If somebody just told you you got married and you say, turn to page 56. That's not interactive. It's not situated, it's not creative. It's not jointly constructed. It's not embodied, it's not brought back. Because language learning, hello, Earl Stevick said it a long time ago. It's not about the materials. It's not about page 56. It's not about the techniques. I'm sorry, Lizzie. It's not about drilling and linguistic analysis. It's not about the grammar and moral. It's more about what goes on inside and between the people in the classroom. And that's what I want to focus on, the between the people in the classroom. Because after all, um, particularly language learning, is all those things. It's situated, it's contextualized, it's embodied, it's interactive. That's how we learned our first language, after all, on our caretaker's, caregiver's knee. Um, here's an example of a caregiver in a kitchen. She's in the kitchen with her 20-month-year-old son called Mark. Their first language, his first language is English. They're talking in English. Uh, and the gas, um, the gas, thing there you can see the picture of it ignites yeah makes a little popping sound the central heating boiler and little mark says oh popped on pardon says mother who's otherwise occupied it popped on says mark it popped on yeah what did uh fire uh the fire yeah pop the fire popped it fire at Mark. oh yes the fire popped on didn't it <laughs> yeah you see what's happening there the mother is co-constructing this child's conversation, you know, which goes from a subject-less phrasal verb popped on to a almost fully syntactic sentence. Yes, pop the fire, pop it fire, etc. You know, given a little bit more scaffolding, key word there, then um, he might have got all the way. That comes from a wonderful study of learning through interaction. Yeah, that's the name of the book. And that's what we're talking about because this is how we learn our first language. We didn't read page 56. We were allowed to talk about, we're allowed to initiate conversations about whatever we want. And so Evelyn Hatch way, way, way back said in this amazing paper, language learning, is not about teaching, learning the grammar and the vocabulary and then having conversations. Uh, this is the bit that you don't see here. This is what she says. It's not about learning the grammar and the syntax and the phonology and then having conversations. Yeah? As Harold Palmer would have it, yeah? don't get them to speak before they're ready. No, language learning evolves out of learning how to carry on conversations. Emphasis in the original, out of, not before, not after, but out of learning how to carry on conversations. One learns how to do conversation. One learns how to interact verbally. And out of this interaction, the language emerges. First language anyway. And why not the second language? But we'll come to that point in a minute. So according to this theory, talk, this interactive talk between Mark and his mother is used to construct knowledge, knowledge of the language. It's a social process, yeah? It's a historical process in the sense that the talk generates its own context and continuity. Now he's talking about classrooms now. He's talking about classrooms and mainstream classrooms, mainstream education, math, geography, social studies, whatever, yeah? It's a social historical in the sense that the talk generates its own context and continuity so that the knowledge that is created listen to this, carries with it echoes of the conversations in which it was generated. That knowledge that you're acquiring from this conversation resonates with all these conversations that you've had before. And he goes on to say, and this is, uh, ta -da, this is my big moment when a teacher always uses. I just was muted. Am I still muted? No. When a teacher, am I muted? No, you're good. Sorry. Okay. When a teacher and a group of learners are working together, the talk in one lesson can be thought of as one part of a long conversation that lasts for the whole of their relationship. 
yeah, long conversations, not like Jorge's wedding. It was a very short conversation. And this is the biggest quote of the day. The next one, I'll just let you read it at your leisure. Okay, so we don't just teach one-off lessons. We teach terms, we teach semesters, we teach months, we teach courses, we teach years. Over this time, there's continuity. Members come to know each other as people. So this is where I'm pinning my argument. The fact that these conversations are not just the conversations that's happened at the beginning of the lesson. Did you have a nice weekend? But they accumulate. All those little conversations about the weekend are cumulative in the sense that we get to know each other. They build a social dynamic and that we cross reference. So the next lesson we say to Jorge, how's your wedding? How's your marriage? Is it holding up? And that's the difference between this kind of conversation, how many fingers have I got, which is a very short conversation, whereas, as opposed to how many brothers have you got? And various, various people, not me, I mean, I'm just following on the shoulders of great people like Leo Van Lee have been saying long ago, that for a long time, students' opportunities to exercise initiative or to develop a sense of control and self-regulation a sense of ownership of the discourse, a sense of being empowered, he says, are extremely restricted in the IRF format. Remember the IRF format? Initiate, respond, feedback. Yeah, number one here. How many fingers have I got? Five. Good. They have very little control or ownership of the discourse. Yeah, so it's a bit like talking to the Turing machine. Yeah. It's a bit like non-human interaction. Whereas, if I said to you, how many brothers have you got? Chances are, you'd also say five. But then I would say, wow. I wouldn't say good. Okay, right. How many toes have you got? Five, good. Yeah? So no, wow, who's the oldest? Wally, and how old is he? 27, what does he do? He's a, mm -mm. okay, ask each other and off you go. Longer conversation based on real questions, real questions. Okay, um, here's an example, because you wonder, what, what's he on about? What's wrong with, what am I wearing? What am I wearing? What am I wearing? Here's an example of uh, a transcript of a conversation where, it alternates between, the teacher alternates between having a conversation, sorry, transcript of a lesson, having a conversation and then teaching. And that's, so on the left, you have this conversation. There's a lot of before, we don't see all this. She's talking to a student about her job uh, at a hospital. Yeah? So this is in a foreign language, English language classroom. And it goes on before, but then it gets to the point, says the teacher says, so, so you were delivering mail to the patients? Yeah. How many times did you go? No, 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 no. The, I, I should go, but I didn't go. And the teacher says, I was supposed to go. That's a good one. I was supposed to go. Listen, I was, here we are, Lizzie, here's some drilling. Everyone, I was supposed to go. Again, I was supposed to go, but I couldn't, but I couldn't, but I couldn't. Again, but I couldn't. So, so on. And then, uh, and then she says, okay, because the baby's sick. You know, I couldn't go. Uh, and then she says to the student, is, is the baby still very sick? What's the matter? Oh, he don't know. Oh, mm, that's a problem then. Yeah? So compare that with Jorge's wedding. So the baby's sick, but she takes a detour, what one writer calls an instructional detour, to make a little language point. And then she goes back to the baby. Of course. Don't forget the baby. The baby's more important than page 56. How does she do this? She does it like a little bit like uh, Mark's mother in the kitchen. You know? There's a kind of scaffolding going on here. And as Steve Walsh has said, and he's researched this exhaustively, the role of the teacher is central to co-constructing, co-constructing, 
yeah, jointly constructing a dialogue in which learning opportunities are maximized. Yeah, that learning opportunity. Oh, here's a chart. Here's a nice expression. I was supposed to go, but I couldn't. Learning opportunities are maximized through the use of specific interactional strategies to scaffold, shape, and clarify learner contributions. This is what's called instructional conversation in the literature, not just of language classrooms, but all sorts of classrooms. Instructional, it's not conversation entirely. It's not just talking about the baby or Jorge's wedding. It's instructional. There are opportunities embedded in this conversation for learning stuff, yeah? And so these scholars say the task of schooling can be seen as one of creating and supporting instructional conversations. And now there's a paradox here because instruction and conversation appear contrary. On the one hand, instruction, authority, planning, page 56, blah, blah, blah. On the other, equality and responsiveness, yeah? So it's like the non-human and the human. The task of teaching, this is the key, the task of teaching is to resolve this paradox. And they are going to say, resoundingly, to most truly teach, one must converse. To truly converse is to teach. Or put much more simply, the classroom may be viewed as an ecological environment in which lesson and conversation are not two separate things. A uh, little five minute chat at the beginning of the lesson, then page 56. No, lesson and conversation are relational to each other, needing one another for ecological balance. You can, uh, and so hence a lot of interest in recent years in conversation as conversation as a potential source of learning opportunities. Okay, I'm going to turn my chat on. I mean, open it up and just see, uh, because we're talking about conversation. So it behooves me to listen to you. Um, and <laughs> Okay, and now I'm just, this is like anything I need to be dealing with immediately i'm assuming you can still hear me um okay so well i mean the question is i guess now well what in practical terms does this mean and let's just let me give you a list i think uh, and before we have a chance to talk about this how do you create the conditions for a long conversation and then I've kind of I've answered some of these questions already. Um, you ask real questions. You ask real questions. It doesn't mean to say that every question has to be a real question, although it's interesting, and I've done this, I tried this with a class, is to teach a class with asking only real questions. And it's quite a challenge. It's easy at the beginning of the lesson. Yeah, what did you do at the weekend? It gets more difficult when you're teaching the present perfect continuous. But it, it can be done. And it's, a, it's an experiment I recommend. Claire Cramsh, again, way back, says the number of, keep the number of display questions to a minimum. She also adds, uh, you know, it's not just the questions, it's how you respond to the answers, uh, which is equally important. Pay attention. When the student says, I got married this weekend, yeah, or I get married this weekend, you don't say, no, I got, listen, I got married, get, got, got repeat you know no you say you got married wow that's amazing but listen in the past yeah keep your comments for later and use natural feedback wow interesting awesome good advice from claire crouch okay second point on my list wait time wait don't leap in before the students have a chance to articulate an answer give them time to think this is why my exercise at the beginning, yeah? Don't press send, you know, yet. Wait till I, and you can do that in the real classroom. Don't answer my question. What's the capital of Peru? Don't answer my question, write it down. Yeah, what's the past of go? Don't answer my question. Think about it before you blurt it out. A study of ESL classrooms in Canada. Hi, Jennifer Jones. Two of the most striking figures of this analysis were that one, this is a study show that teachers ask almost all the questions in the class, teachers, and more 
interestingly here, students were rarely given sufficient time to formulate their answers. This happens in mainstream classes as well as language classes, but it would seem to be more acute in language classes because you need longer time to formulate your answer. Encourage learners to ask the questions. Well, that follows from what we've just said. What we've said, students ask remarkably few questions. I mean, remarkably few. And also, given in English, at least, the question forms are one of the most grammatically difficult. One would think that the more practice, the better. Value learner initiated talk. When the learners initiate a topic or ask a question, don't look at your watch. Now, don't riffle through your course book. Value what they've got to say. Rod Ellis. Most of these references are 20, 30 years old. So, I mean, I don't apologize for that fact. It's just that people have been saying this for a long time. And I, you know, I don't see a lot of evidence in classes I want still that people are taking. Opportunities for giving learners control of the discourse will arise naturally in the course of a language lesson. Jorge's wedding. The extent aha, to which teachers grasp these opportunities may well prove more crucial for creating the optimal conditions for acquisition to take place than any planned decisions they make. The way that the teacher could have picked up on Jorge's wedding rather than and dropped page 56 may have had more lasting effect on learners' motivation, apart from anything else, as well as on them uh, learning. Personalize the lesson content. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, it's kind of obvious, you know, but you have them talk about their family. Institute learner, getting learners to do show and tell, present, perform, etc. I'm not going to talk about that within time. Talking circles. Um, again, fairly obvious what that is. There's a nice article, again, way, way, way back, 1994. The talking circle is a group activity. Uh, and this teacher wrote it up, describes. It takes place at the beginning of the lesson. Almost every day, teacher and students gather in the talking circle. So it's a physical circle. It's a breakout room online to share and discuss experiences, anecdotes, news, special events, introduce the weekly theme and the like. Now, my colleague, Neil, Neil of the train of the Our Teacher Never Talks to Us, his, he always began his lesson with a talking circle. Students knew this was going to happen that you would have to sit in a circle and talk about something you'd seen or heard or read since the last lesson. And you told each other about it. And the teacher circulated, was there as a consultant. Listen, which maybe that's a story, interesting one I can pick up on later. Although the teacher might open the discussion by suggesting a general topic, the overriding assumption is the talking circle provides a place and an audience for students to discuss anything of interest to them. And that anything of interest to them this is where, again, the magpie teacher, the teacher who picks up, looks for affordances, things that they can, opportunities, will say, oh, that's a good story. Marta, tell the whole class about this thing you read about last night, about the guy in the blah, blah, blah. And then you've got a lesson. Better than, more memorable, I would argue, than page 56, but uh, who knows. Share your own story, your stories, yeah, as a model for how students could tell their stories, but also out of creating interest and showing a degree of, of uh, symmetry, if you like, or reciprocity between you and the learners. Sit down, tell them your story. Teacher training courses in Barcelona, we encourage teachers to do this, trainee teachers on CELTA courses. Tell the students the stories, tell them something that happened. We also uh, got feedback from learners through their diaries that the trainees, uh, the, the, the teaching practice students, uh, their feedback on things that they liked and didn't like. And this is what one student said about their lessons. I enjoy more when a teacher sits down in front of us and explains the real thing that happened to him or her. And then he asks us for similar situations that we can have gone through. I mean, no, yeah. Uh, and, oh, well, I mean, if this is possible, remove the classroom walls. Um, 
those of you who have done courses with me recently will recall me telling you the story about the Australian uh, volunteer, kind of Peace Corps teacher who went, was sent to Papua New Guinea uh, to teach in a village for a year, to teach the whole curriculum, uh, primary school, and he lost everything on the way, all his equipment, all his lesson plans, all his copies of Headway Intermediate or whatever, fell in a ditch, a river. Uh, so what did he do? He had to improvise. He improvised out of what was there uh, in the village. I asked the children to show me what they wanted to know about and gradually introduced English through their responses. We did our math and science in the bush by estimating how many kernels we could get from any of corn. We checked the villages, we went blah, 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 blah. Yeah, an emergent curriculum in the wild. And language learning in the wild has become a bit of a buzz term. In fact, education in the wild has become a, a buzz term. There's a whole group uh, in Scandinavia dedicated to learning local languages like Finnish, Icelandic, Danish, etc. in the wild, sending the students out into the city uh, to have interactions which they film, record, etc., and report on. Uh, this is how it's described in a recent article. Learners first prepared for interactions. They prepared in the classroom yeah, for these real interactions like this, and then um, they video, video each other and then they later reflected on the classroom experiences back in the classroom. But clearly, there are constraints on to the extent that you can take your student, students out. Well, I remember when I first started teaching in, in Hastings in the south, on the south coast of England, uh, we, I, I used to drag my students out to the street and wander around the market. And then finally, be spontaneous, you know, be spontaneous, be prepared to ditch page 56, be prepared to run with Jorge's wedding, be prepared. Uh, we do this in real life. Why can't we do it in the classroom? Now, we're not machines. We are human beings. We have the skills to maintain conversations, to deal with the unpredictable, even if it's in a second language, even if it's in a classroom. Um, Successful teaching necessarily involves an element of improvisation, an element of improvisation. And if you're just starting your career as a teacher, and no doubt you have been, it's been imprinted upon you that the lesson plan is the most important thing in the world. It is, indeed it is, but it's only there as a structure. Uh, it's only there as a scaffold, if you like, within which and out of which you may need to depart, yeah? in the, as in the case of Jorge's wedding. So what we're talking about here is essentially a kind of teaching which is, it's conversational and then that it prioritizes conversation. It's a long conversation because it's cumulative and it goes on over the course of the, uh, the term, the semester, the school year or whatever, whether you're teaching in a classroom, whether you're teaching one-to-one, -one, whether you're teaching online, uh, it's still a long conversation and it reverberates over time and things get repeated. And that's very good for language learning. Vocabulary gets repeated. Apart from anything else, expressions get repeated. You can take a note of them. One of the advantages of teaching online is it's easier to record what's going on, yeah? to save the chat, for example. And you've got your long conversation which you can go back to and mine the useful expressions, errors, and so on. So we're talking about a kind of uh, teaching which is more focused on real questions than display questions, more focused on real communication rather than non-human communication. What, might, what some people have called, or Claire Cramsh again is called dialogic teaching, a dialogic pedagogy. It's unlike the traditional pedagogy. What am I wearing? What am I wearing? What am I wearing? It sets new goals for teachers. A dialogue, new goals, poetic, psychological, political goals that do not constitute an easy to follow method. Unfortunately, it's not like you know what they taught you on the CELTA course. Such a pedagogy should be better described not as a blueprint for how to teach foreign languages, not, a, not as a method, but as another way of being a language teacher. I would say another way of being a human being. And that, my friends, is that. And we've got 
precisely five minutes for a real conversation. So I suggest, um, because there's quite a lot of us, uh, I don't think we'll, I don't know, what do you think? Allow people to put their hands up and then um, fire away, or should we just use the chat? This is where my Zoom skills start to fall apart. What do you think, well, Lizzie? Well, there's lots of chat going on in the, in, so we're listening to you and it's, I feel like we could talk about this forever um, because it is so, so interesting. Um, but there has already been a conversation going on and a very genuine one there as well. So it's uh, really good to see that. Some of the features, I guess, are about, you know, how as teachers we can do this. Um, and the role, I guess what's occurred to me is sort of the role of teaching techniques in this. And is there a role? I guess yeah. that's a question for you. Is there a role for the, the sort of techniques that we do teach on CELTA and DELTA courses within this big conversation? Absolutely. I think there's at two levels, many levels. Uh, and I would say there's, 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 there's the kind of mega level, if you like, in terms of the curriculum, the design of the curriculum, over which most teachers don't have a huge degree of agency, let's say, or control, yeah? So the course book is established, the exams are established, you've got to teach it. You've got to teach page 56, eventually. So we have less control over that. Uh, there's the middle level, the meso level, if you like, which is the lesson plan itself, which we do have more control over as teachers, mm -hmm. even though it may well be pegged to a course book or a curriculum or a test or whatever, but we do have a, a bit of room there. Uh, and the door is shut, you know, nobody's watching. So mm -mm -mm. Um, <laughs> at the micro level is the one that interests me most, which is the actual way that we interact at the level of question and answer. That's why I'm banging on about real questions as opposed to display questions. You know, we all ask display questions. Uh, one of the people who wrote most about this topic, is a woman called Courtney Kasdan in the 1990s, she was at teacher trainer at Harvard Educational School. And then she took a year off and went to a marginal school in California to teach, you know, a mainstream high school school. And she was, it was part of a PhD that somebody was doing and they recorded everything she did. And she was shocked to discover that 66%, she was, she monopolized the classroom talking time, 66%. And this is a person who'd stuck. So it's very difficult to get away from that kind of controlling talk. And it is controlling. If you've got a large class of teenagers, it's the only way, apart from drilling them, that you can control them by asking all the questions. Yeah. But I do think that if you start to open up a little bit these cracks in the lesson and allow some of the spontaneity to come out, then you will discover that it's not all gonna fall apart because it doesn't, you know, humans are humans and they prefer human. Our, our teacher never talks to us. That's what it's all about. Our teacher never talks. She's a fabulous teacher. She knows everything about the third conditional, but she never talks to us. So that's a long answer to your question. Somebody else just asked a question about how do we encourage students to ask more questions? Well, there's a whole talk unto itself, but I would say um, build in you know, slots into the lesson when they, you have, they're permitted to ask and say, okay, any, and don't, don't do this. I've seen this so many times. The teacher says, I've seen this. There's a very famous speaker at conferences called, I'm not, no, I can't give his name, but he, he says, uh, <laughs> he's talk, he walks down the middle of the room. He says, uh, are there any questions? And then he turns around and he walks back to his podium and people go, and he doesn't see them. Now, we all know that conferences, people ask stupid questions and they ask questions simply to showcase some point that they've been, you know, because their talk was rejected and therefore they're going to bang on about it in your five minute question and answer slot. But students have valid questions. We must let them. Uh, and on, you see, Zoom is actually quite good for this because of the chat and because of the one way personal chat, they can ask you private questions while it's going on. So building that in. Uh, and then rewarding the questions when they come up, even if it's kind of dumb, you say, oh, God, that's a, like, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, anybody got an answer to that? And that you bring everybody in. But there's lots and lots and lots and lots of ways of getting the students to ask questions. I would love to design a lesson 
Uh, you used to do, I've done, I did attempt this once uh, by having students, I said, we're going to do the present perfect next lesson. And this is intermediate class, go away, for homework, prepare questions you want to ask me about the present perfect. And so we start with the students' questions. It's high risk, because you may not be able to answer them, but you know, between them, they can probably, and I think, you know, you can say, I'm a human being too. I'm not a computer. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm going to go away and look it up. Okay, Lizzie, how are we doing? That's very nice to hear. I can hear the sighs of relief from around the, the world. Yes, I know. <laughs> I, I do sense that uh, I'm preaching as usual to the converted, but, uh, but it's always good to hear, isn't it? Absolutely. No, what an amazing, yeah, it's reframed a lot of what we sort of get stressed about with teaching, which is I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do, and then I've got to do this, and then I've got to do this. Well, actually, what you've got to be is yourself, and that's the way to get the most sort of out of when, your When When uh, Brian Christian was applying for this job to be the interlocutor, the human interlocutor, he said to, he said to the people who organized, he said, well, what am I meant to do? And they said, just be yourself. And he <laughs> said, that's actually quite difficult. <laughs> that is really, really difficult. And he had to go away and study what it is to be yourself in conversation. <laughs> And that's why he wrote the book. Anyway. Amazing. Brilliant. <laughs> Scott, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm sure.